hey, I'm going to go through OpenBSD's entire init system today. Oh, really, huh? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go through the whole thing in every little detail, but watch this video and know what your init system is doing at startup with OpenBSD in 15 minutes. Okay, then what were all those other videos for? You know, I don't need your SAS right now. Well, you know, seems to me like your videos are kind of bloated. What's that supposed to mean? I think it means that even though you're making these videos about OpenBSD init, they're in the style of System D. What? No, 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 no. Oh, it's new to dev. All right, welcome back. So we've covered all of the functions that there are in the RC init. So now it's time to take a look at what this root shell script actually does. And uh, I'm gonna go pretty fast because we've covered all the functions. So it should be pretty quick to explain for everything that is pretty quick to explain. So we're going to allow, you can see a status report with control T. Um, that's kind of cool. I've actually done that before. <clears throat> These are set some trap handlers to do nothing essentially. <clears throat> set some variables, set the host name and the domain name, parse the configuration files rc.conf and rc.conf.local to get some variables into scope. If we're running this at shutdown time, uh, which in which case will be passed this shutdown parameter as the first argument to the script. Then we're gonna push the random seed. We're going to not do the rest of this stuff if we haven't made it out of single user mode yet. But otherwise, we're going to run the stop, stop all the package scripts in the reverse order that we started them in and then <clears throat> stop the virtual machine daemon and then run the rc.shutdown script if it exists. And then if there are any carp interfaces, we're gonna bring those down. That way, so carp is a way to, especially with routers, if you wanna have multiple routers and one set up as a failover, and another as the primary, CARP is the way that you do that with OpenBSD. <clears throat> so we'll see that again later. That's the only reason why I even mention it. <clears throat> and then this is just, if boot blocks failed to give us some random data, try to cause some churn in the system. <clears throat> if we, well, we're gonna turn on all of the swap devices that are on physical disks because you might need them for some of these file system checks. If you're running a file system check on a really large file system, you might need some swap space if you don't have a lot of memory. And I've got a note here that says, if you're coming into this after single user mode, file system checks won't be run. And they won't even warn you about it like they will if you have this fast boot file in the root system. <clears throat> So something to keep in mind if you have to boot single user mode for something. Then we'll install a trap handler for the interrupt so you can type control C to exit the boot process and go into single user mode. We unmount all file systems except root and then remount all of them except for those that are on network file systems or VND file systems. VND file system stands for virtual node, but it's essentially a way to treat a regular file as a disk. So <clears throat> if I have a disk image, say something that I'm going to write like an install disk that I'm gonna write to like a USB drive, <clears throat> I can mount it as a VNode and look at it as if it had been put on a disk. <clears throat> so that's kind of interesting. We've also, <clears throat> We're also gonna remount the root file system read write. And this is just for NFS really. Change some permissions for the kernel and then save it as the bsd.booted because at the end of the script, we're gonna reorder that kernel file. And then we're gonna remove that fastboot file if it existed. 
we're gonna set all of the flags on in the Etsy TTYs file. This doesn't actually initialize the, the virtual terminals like they're going to be on any modern computer. That gets done after this script exits <clears throat> by init. But we're gonna set all of the flags, set the keyboard encoding, and then if you want like a special keyboard map or something, you can do that with wscons control. That wscons-control.conf file <clears throat> in Etsy. And then we're gonna set up a temporary packet filtering rule set if you have packet filtering enabled. So <clears throat> the way that this works very briefly is that you read every line in your packet filtering file. And here we're just creating a string and then we're going to pipe it to PF control. But <clears throat> all you really wanna do is, the way, that, or the way that this works is you read through each line and the last line that a packet, a starting packet, an initial packet of a session or a socket, the initial packet the first one that matches, or the last line that matches any of the parameters for that packet is the one that determines the action that is taken, which is almost always either pass or block. <clears throat> and <clears throat> packets that are part of that session afterward are automatically allowed through. So you're really just saying, hey, do I want to allow this session? And it has ways of matching this even for protocols like UDP or ICMP that don't have sessions in the same way that TCP does, they'll match based on like source and destination addresses and ports. But, and for ICMP, they match based on the socket that the ICMP message is about. But this is essentially going to allow us to have SSH connections come in sorry it's going to allow us to any SSH port but the first packet has to be coming in so that means that you're going to allow SSH connections in we're going to allow domain name look at lookups going out we're going to allow ping pings and we're going to allow dhcp packets to go in and out <clears throat> if we have ip version 6 we're going to allow neighbor solicitation and advertisements as well as router solicitations and advertisements as well as dhcp for version 6 to go in and out if <clears throat> we're also going to for any carp protocol packets we're gonna keep state, but we're not going to have them go out on the PF sync interface if that exists. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we're not going to allow them any initial outgoing packets for right now. That'll get changed later. <clears throat> but, and then if you have NFS, sometimes NFS implementations will fragment IP packets, but then not, will then set the don't fragment flag in them. So this is changing some of that stuff. <clears throat> and then we're gonna pass that to the packet filter and enable it. <clears throat> and then we're going to disable using certain UDP and TCP ports for dynamic <clears throat> port allocation run everything in your syscontrol conf file, start the stateless auto address configuration daemon, <clears throat> which is how you'll get your DHCP going for both IP version four and six. We're going to turn off CARP preempting. So that CARP thing that I was talking about, if we're the primary router in that CARP setup and we're rebooting for whatever reason, we don't want to start taking over responsibilities until we're all the way booted. So that's what we're doing there. This essentially just reads your hostname.if files and runs if config accordingly. There's a couple tweaks or shortcuts that you can use with that, <clears throat> but I'm not gonna get into that. <clears throat> it's pretty simple to look at the source code and see what's going on. So 
do some default routing as well. I don't know if I mentioned that already. And then we're gonna mount these file systems if they haven't already been mounted. Start some more daemons, push the random seed into the kernel, reorder libraries. <clears throat> if we've got some auto configured, we've got some auto conf interfaces, we're gonna wait a little while to see, make sure that those come up so that we've got some outgoing routes. And then we're gonna load the default packet filtering if we want packet filtering. The default packet filter for OpenBSD is very liberal. So you might wanna take a look at that if you want a more strict firewall in your machine. And then we're gonna remove some leftover files <clears throat> like Etsy no login and var spool lock lock.star. <clears throat> this utemp is the current user's file, so we're gonna erase that, fill it with a, an empty one, <clears throat> and then remove anything in auth pf, <clears throat> save a copy of the boot messages, make any uh, public and private keys if we need to, start some more daemons, load ipsec rules if we need to, start some more daemons, <clears throat> specifically these port mapping and YP stands for yellow pages. I don't really know anything about this, but <clears throat> if you're not running these daemons, it's not gonna do anything. And then we're gonna mount any remaining file systems <clears throat> and do an additional file system check on those. Build these databases. I'm not totally sure what this KVM make be make database <clears throat> function is doing or what it's for. I looked into it a little bit. This dev make database seems like it's just making it easier to access files in the dev directory <clears throat> because on OpenBSD that directory is huge. It's got over 1,100 devices in it by default, and then. <clears throat> save any core crash dumps if we want to, store ACPI tables if you have a bug that you want to send in a bug report for, <clears throat> turn on quota checking if you want that, set proper permissions for TTY files, <clears throat> check and see if this ptemp file exists, in that case, you might have shut down while you were changing something in the Etsy password file. Clear everything from temp except the files lost and found, quota user and quota group and vi.recover. Create some socket directories. <clears throat> Run uh, rc.secure level. Set the secure level if it wasn't specified to something other than negative one or two in this file, <clears throat> change the message of the day file to be accurate if need to, <clears throat> turn on accounting if you want it, <clears throat> which is a way to see like what processes are using what resources and whether they crashed, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> the quota control that I mentioned above is limiting the amount of space that certain users can use on the hard disk. This LD config <clears throat> makes it easier for your dynamic linker to find the libraries and load them quickly. <clears throat> Preserve editor files if you crash while you were running VI. <clears throat> Run sysmerge, the sysmerge script just once and then delete it if it exists. Start a whole bunch more daemons if you've got them enabled. Run first time, the first time script if that exists and then delete it <clears throat> run the start the package daemons in the order that you specify and then uh, if you have custom things that you want done at startup you can put them in etsy rc.local and that'll happen and then undo that carp demotion so if you're running this as a pair of routers and this is the primary one you can start taking things over now and then run your mixer control configuration. So that's for like sound system stuff. <clears throat> Start some local daemons, reorder the kernel in the background, print the date, 
and exit zero. So <clears throat> that's pretty cool that you can see everything that your system is doing at startup so quickly. Everything that happens after this in init is just initializing TTYs and looking for children that were started and then orphaned or whatever and uh, waiting on them so that you don't have a bunch of zombie processes waiting around. So that's it. That's the OpenBSD init system. I know I've spent a lot of time on other videos, but this is really like an overview and <clears throat> hopefully you know, if you've got questions about startup, you can use this as a guide on OpenBSD to figure out what's going on. But that's it for this one. Hit like if you like this video, hit dislike if you didn't like it. In either case, let me know in the comments down below why you liked or didn't like it, as well as if you've got any questions, criticisms, or concerns. And as always, if you wanna get notified when I make new videos, hit subscribe. Thanks, peace.